Before I introduce our features for this morning, I'd like to begin with this poem, which is called Sometimes by David Budbill. When I harvest vegetables from the garden all day, then drink tea and doze in the late afternoon sun, and in the evening one night make pickled beets and green tomato chutney, the next red tomato chutney, and the day after that pick the fruits of my arbor and make grape jam. When we walk in the woods every evening over fallen leaves, through yellow light when nights are cool and days warm, when I am so happy I am afraid I might explode or disappear or somehow be taken away from all this. At those times when I feel so happy, so good, so alive, so in love with the world, with my own sensuous, beautiful life, suddenly I think about all the suffering and the pain in the world, the agony and dying. I think about all those people being tortured right now in my name but I still feel happy and good, alive and in love with the world and with my lucky, guilty, sensuous, beautiful life. Because I know in the next minute or tomorrow, all this may be taken from me. And therefore, I've got to say right now, what I feel and know and see, I've got to say right now, how beautiful and sweet this world can be. By David Budbill. And like David Budbill gets out in this poem, as we all know, life has its dark and light moments. As, some, as writers, some of us prefer to talk about the dark, and some of us prefer to only focus on the light. And there are some who have a gift of looking at both sides and saying, here's this life. Let me talk about all of it with you up close. Taking in all of it and helping to transform and transport all of it through the art of poetry and song. This comes across with our three features today. And I'm very happy and honored to introduce all through and beginning with Laura Gold. Laura comes from Newton, Massachusetts. She grew up in Concord. As a child, her favorite pastime was playing the guitar since she was seven years old and writing songs at 11. And she spent a lot of her time in songwriting with her brother Daniel, who was six years older, and they would share their songs with one another, and Laura also noted that she learned her brother's songs and sang them as well, and loved his music. And years later, in 1980, he passed away when he was just in his 20s, and Laura notes that much of his music still lives on in her, and much of her songwriting has been inspired by him. She went to study social work at Sarah Lawrence College, and she works presently as a geriatric social worker with the elderly population, and she's been doing that for 18 years. Laura said that um, she works in different capacities with the geriatric population, and she has even been allowed to witness the end of their lives being with them. And her work with them has encouraged her to contemplate what aging means for herself as well as society. Laura has continued to write songs and performed at a number of concerts, features, and fundraisers. She's recorded one CD with Seth Connolly and is just about finished with her second. Done. It's done. <laughs> so she and you have both CDs here today. Talk to Laura about the CDs. <laughs> Laura said that she believes inspiration for writing songs come from a, comes from a mysterious place which revolves around existential questions and relationships. At its best, Laura said, it allows me to be emotionally deeper and less cerebral than I usually am. When I asked Laura about a, memorable, a most memorable moment in performing her songs, she said, any time I'm at an open mic or out there performing and my song touches another person, that is memorable to me. And so we're very fortunate to have her here, here to share a few songs with us this morning. Please help me welcome Laura Gold. It's really... A pleasure to be here, and thank you, Cheryl, for not only inviting me, but those very kind words. So. <coughs> Your love came to me softly, like a gently 
flowing stream and then it grew much stronger much more than I had dreamed if life has any most recent song I've written. Um, <laughs> I wonder if you came back today what you would say about my life I wonder have I lived it well? How would you tell? And would you wish you were still around? Well, I'm okay now, but I wish somehow we could do it all over again. If I had been a better friend I wonder Cause I still miss you the qu- 
quiet moments you have with someone you know will always be there I wonder if you came back today what you would say about your death I wonder what you day you took your last breath you chose that day and in a way I can understand why you left life was too hard for you to go on but in a I still miss you and I wish you were still here it's been 28 years will it be 28 more before I see your face again and could that moment when songs that were never sung the quiet laughter you have with someone you know will always be And um, I don't know if you could, you picked it up, but that was written about um, my brother, who did pass away. Actually, he was 30 in 1980. Um, and the reason is, uh, as if this song didn't actually tell you, but he, he suffered from uh, paranoid schizophrenia for a number of years. And then he, as many people with that disease do, he took his own life. So, so I thought I'd sing one of his songs. Uh, this is a song I've been singing, and this time I'm going to actually get this in tune. Because it really... Just don't it when it's out of tune it's all right that should do it this song is a song I've been singing since I was in eighth grade <clears throat> and it's one of my brothers he wrote it when he was about 18 maybe earlier love me make me believe in my dreams make me conceive in what now seems to be an illusion and hold me as if your heart was your guide
six minutes? Okay. I'm going to sing one last song, and um, it's one of my newer ones also. Um, if you want to hear a version of my voice that actually sounds a little stronger, you can uh, get one of my CDs, but uh, the beauty of being able to re-record and insert and yeah. Some people are very good. They sound exactly the same, you know, like Kim out there. It's like, oh, that's probably what... And those are the people that can do live recordings. But then there's people like me. I'm not supposed to put myself down, but oh well. That's, that's sort of my nature, too. But... Uh, too, although it's not that new anymore. Um, <coughs> sort of speaks to the mystery of life.
never quite know why The stage may be set for you to leave But inside Cheryl. Rick McIntyre is a performance poet who comes from Providence, Rhode Island, who speaks from the heart, soul, and funny bone on stage, and I get the impression off stage as well, as when I asked him, where do you spend your childhood? And Rick replied, in my head mostly. And when I asked Rick, what was your favorite pastime as a child, he said, playing in the woods, pretending I was the only survivor in either A, a post-apocalyptic world, B, a time travel accident that landed me in the days of the dinosaurs, or C, a post-apocalyptic world with dinosaurs. After high school, Rick stated that he hung around with poets and in poetry readings where he picked up as much as he could about writing and performing by osmosis and places of employment were rarely places of inspiration for him. As he took on performance poetry, he went to Boston First National Slam in 1991. He won the 2004 Cambridge Poetry Award for Humor. He was featured at the first Legends of Slam Showcase in 2006. He's published in a number of journals and anthologies. He's performed in schools from grades kindergarten to college. He has toured nationally and in Canada, and he's opened for acts like Leon Redbone, Andre Kodescu and more. He's the co-host of the Cantab Poetry Slam and Open Mic, and he's the host and editor of Got Poetry. When asked for a most memorable moment being a host of a poetry venue, Rick said, any time I have seen a tentative new reader take flight. And when asked, what do you think it is about life that inspires you to write poems? Rick said, poor coping skills. <laughs> A desperate need for audience validation, and the simple need to give people a few moments of entertainment and uplift. Rick will be doing so this evening as well at the Stone Soup Coffee House in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and we have information about that, so you can see him now, and you can see him tonight. And right now, we look forward to these next few moments of Rick McIntyre sharing his words to entertain and uplift us as well. Please help me welcome Rick McIntyre. Hi, it's nice to be here under these glaring lights. I'm far too pale. Excuse me. Okay. <clears throat> you know, this world is lost, but the last thing I would wish for it is a sense of direction. I don't think we can trust maps anymore, not when we put them on the table and they, they just lie there. No, it's time to think outside. So pretend you could fly. 
If you flew east as hard as you could, far enough to circle the world, would you come home again? Well, yes, but from the west. And if you flew north enough, you'd head over the pole till you were flying south, till you headed over the pole flying north. You're going in circles because this world is bipolar and maps are part of the problem. It's not that they don't lead us places, but there are things we think maps are telling us like, here is better than there, so we must be better than them. And so we have wars of north against south, east versus west, as if right and wrong were just location, location, location. And maps trick us into believing we don't belong to the land. The land belongs to our territory. We've forgotten that our hearts know what home looks like. We keep fighting over real estate. And we're just as confused about up. I mean, what's up with that? We mistake plans to conquer space for some kind of spiritual ascension. Believe if there's a perfect place, we'll only find it up in heaven. But once we find it, we will map it and it will be ours. <laughs> but you know, if somebody else, even from a culture I'm told is our enemy, sought their own heaven following different cartography, even if their spaceship took off from the other side of the world from us, guess what? It would still be going up. So it doesn't matter who wins that race. Once we're out there in space, the only place left to go is farther away. And if the human race moves that far apart because we've forgotten not where we came from, but why, then the only perfect place we would have reached will be lost. This is how maps and legends lead us off course. And their promises of a place we can call home will always lead us astray if they get us to forget this simple truth. That person on the opposite side of the world from me, they're just like me, another human being trying to find their way home. It's time to think bigger than maps and treat words like here and there and me and you as shades of gray, not absolutes. We, we'd find the differences between us are like the borders on a map. They're not there in the real world unless you choose to see them and believe them more than the maps we carry here. Because in our hearts, you are home. X marks the spot because you are here. Now, wherever else you go in life, here is where you begin. If the world ever gets this, it won't be maps that save us. What will matter is if we follow one, we treat it as a guide and not another Bible God gave us. What will matter is the people who believe. Even if we don't know where we're going yet, we can all get there together if we try. You know, the kind of people who believe that people can fly. So this next poem is an exercise in uh, if you do more research, research first, uh, you do less editing later. I had a passage in this uh, poem, and I'm not going to go too much into it, but a friend of mine was doing a poem sharing about his Jewish faith, and he mentioned in it how you know they don't get tattoos because they believe their body is a temple, and I had this line in my poem that I was really aiming towards like intolerant, you know, people and not a major religion. So <laughs> I asked him, you know, you weren't offended when you heard that line, did you? And he's like, well, I know you, which is never a good, you know. <laughs> anyway, so here is the new edited version. I was going to ask if anyone here has a tattoo, but I couldn't see you if you raised your hand. So let's just say that I, I love tattoos. And personally, I have like none. No tattoos. I want them. I do, but not until I can make a good decision that I can live with for more than five minutes. I mean, I can't Netflix without regret, so clearly I'm not ready for ink on flesh, yet someday I'm going to be a collage with legs. I'm going to be a skin diary, my spirit marked on the outside, my heart on one of these sleeves. The first tattoo I'm going to get is a design of the lines of my children's names surrounding the word, these are the important things. Then I'm going to get wings on my back, angels climbing up, stitching spirit to skin. I know I'm still a virgin body modifier, but I want that same thing codified in the secret act of becoming a part of something bigger than just myself. I guess I want to find my tribe.
You know, like all the polysexuals who blur genders and pronouns into a joyful noise their throats can sing. Or people who pierce and pattern themselves to reveal themselves deeper than the skin. Puzzle pieces not interested in fitting in. And really... Anyone who's ever felt different, all of us, private on the outside, monsters in plain sight to an uninspired vanilla world full of people who say, well, I would never do that, and so nobody else should either. <laughs> well, if that's true, then their God is a stick figure, drawn from a poor imagination and a genuine fear of change. I feel that faith should be wildly creative with as many names for God as you can fit in your mouth at one time, one for every color in the sunset, sunrise, skies combined. And maybe that's been the secret behind free will all this time, that we should go and make of ourselves something so beautiful, even God would have to sit back and say, wow. But whether we mark ourselves on the outside or not, these bodies are nothing but dull houses unless they are lived in from within. These are important places. You're an important place. We are all important places because after giving us light to work by, God said to himself, you know, I'm going to let the freak inherit the earth too, just in case the meek aren't up to it. <laughs> And so God gave us these bodies not just as temples, but as templates, because like everything else in the ineffable plan, they were meant to evolve. God made these bodies out of clay for the same reason he gave us hands, so that we could reach inside of us and mold from within the shapes that best fit us. God made us in his, her, its image, but now it's up to each of us to show them what that really looks like. So I have uh, children, which is scary, <laughs> and um, I'm writing stories for children, which is scarier. So uh, I'm going to read something here. No. This is called The Man at the Door. He was in no mood not to sell you something. Dressed in false rags, he came to your door during the part of the day when you were the busiest. Now, wherever he came from, they must not have a word for no, so it'll probably save time, you think, just to look over what he has, and maybe you can find something cheap so it won't send taste, cost you a fortune to send him away. His laugh isn't the greasiest thing about him, and calling the smell coming off of him sour sweet would do an injustice to both words. As you suspected, the tatters that passed for his clothes hold many pockets. From these, he produces a small, collapsible table and bright red silk cloth to cover it with. Then he produces a small bottle, about the size of a salt shaker, and it seems indeed to have about this much salt in it. Unscrewing the cap... And you think you hear a tiny noise when he did, something bad. The raggy, greasy man pours a few dozen of the crystals, bigger than table salt, maybe sea salt, on the red cloth, which is darkening to the color of blood drying. The man seems just a little greasier as he lifts one crystal, bigger than sea salt, like corn kernel size and he sighs this this is love from a time of danger and he replaces it carelessly back on the table with pincer finger and thumb he picks up a second crystal this is the moment of forgetting and a third the fear of loud sounds a fourth a recipe for deceit fifth sixth seventeenth until the numbers blur under the light of these wonders the flavor of pleasant yesterdays a song never written by the Beatles the hesitancy to welcome some one, nothing but vanilla, the history of the cutting blade. His hands are moving quickly, and the crystals, the marble-sized crystals, blink in and out of sight as if you were playing a shell game and not really trying to sell you anything. You stand at the door of your own house, and you have to hold on to the door frame to keep from falling out of your body. There's something happening, and you know whatever you do in the next few moments matters. So you choke back in your throat and ask with an unsteady voice at first, do, <clears throat> do you, these are tough times for everybody, and I just had my hours cut at work, so money's short. <clears throat> do you have any samples I could try? Samples? 
the man all but spits fire. Samples? I'm trying to make a living here. These are wonders, he says with his gray teeth clacking. These are things worth the dreams of sleeping children. Treasures that could push a potential suicide in the right direction and... And what direction is that, you ask? Suddenly clear-headed and fiercely protective of your home and your child sleeping upstairs. The man's eyes flash murderous, and the smell coming off him now is all smoke and rot. And after a moment, he seems to diminish, and you realize what a place of power you're standing on. Like, you, like I said, you add pleasantly, I'm, I got my hours cut and money's tight. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't help you. The man looks like he's going to attack and then deflates further. He sweeps the table salt-sized crystals back in the shaker and with a sweep of his tattered sleeve, the table and the red cloth disappear into his rags. He turns and walks and when he reaches the road, he looks back at you once and at that very moment a bird flies into the bay window, killing itself instantly. You don't even want to know what he's thinking as he walks away. You're just grateful to have your hand on something as solid as your own front door. So I tried that out as a bedtime story, and it didn't, didn't work. So um, this next poem uh, I co-wrote, and uh, you may uh, recognize the other author. <coughs> To be or not to be. So put your hands in the air and sing with me. You see, that was a phrase I used to utter. Now I slap myself when I start to suffer. Slings and arrows of fortune's outrageous. Rather drop rhymes on all the world's stages. Greatest of the Shakespeare tragedies. I'm all H to the A-M-L-E-T. This is my story like you've forgotten. Straight out of Copenhagen because something went rotten. A prince of the realm, I'm all depressed, said. My mom remarried. Daddy two months dead, Horatio. Yo, he got my back. He says, Hamlet, I got news, but it's kind of whack. You see, me and the boys were on watch last night. We saw your daddy's ghost walking in the moonlight. So the very next night, my daddy ghost walked. I pleaded with the shade till he finally talked. Avenge me, Hamlet, and so you know, your uncle is a murderer, your mama is a hoe. <laughs> then, oh no, better grab a box of tissues. Here comes Ophelia with all her issues. I love you, Hamlet. She's making fun of me. Don't go there, girl. Get thee to a nunnery. Ain't like I wouldn't want a piece of that. But everyone thinks that I'm crazy, crazy. So I'm thinking maybe should I just give up? But I ain't drink from that cup. I want to mess things up. And a play within a play will be just the thing where I'll put the conscience of my uncle the king. And the way he'll freak, everyone will tell. That old man is guilty as hell. Even my mom think I'm dangerous mad. I'm all screaming in her face for betraying my dad. And then I stab Polonius right through the curtain. That's what the old man gets for lurking. But if I'm going to get my vengeance, then I need a plan. But my uncle sent me off to be murdered in England. Hey, you roll on me. You get yourself burned. Just ask Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. King thought he taught me a serious lesson. Now I'm coming back for another session to be the Prince of Denmark. You got to roll hard, not mope like a whiny old actor in the graveyard. Alas, poor York. I admit he was all about the jest. He was infinite. But now he's dead, and that's the way it goes. His skull is just a prop in a Shakespeare stage show. Yo, I knew him, Horatio. Then up comes a funeral, all mourners in tow. Who is the corpse I need to know? When I saw it was Ophelia, I started to shiver. What made her do a spalding gray into the river? Brother tries to get all up in my face. I'm like, Laertes, another time, some other place. I'll be more than happy to give you some. A thousand brothers love couldn't equal my sum. So now in the tragedy, we come to act five. More people gonna die. So the king calls a sword fit. Sword fight to settle a bet between me and Lear. He's gonna think I'm stupid. Like, I don't see that's gonna be a trap. Ain't no way I'm going out like that. So the king toasts me, but put something in the wine. But my mama drinks first, and so then she dies. I'm stabbed from behind. That's a terrible act. So I take Lear to sort of way and stab him right back. Before he die, he want to do the right thing. He said, Hamlet, this is all set up by the king. So I stabbed him too. Hold opened his lips. Pour the poison in till he choked on it. Held him tight till he swallowed it all. Said, there's your toast to hell have a nice fall so when the play is over you can tell this was shakespeare look around the stage dead bodies everywhere horatio says good night sweet prince i'm like whatever all the rest is silence <laughs> a 
Luckily, he's dead. <laughs> okay, this is a fairly new poem, so uh, may not be off page, as we say in the slam nation. It's great. If you ever at a poetry slam and somebody like forgets a poem, what you'll hear is people in the audience going, you got it, man. You got it. You got it. And I always say, like, clearly I don't. <laughs> and stop clicking at me. My daughter spends all day practicing slapstick comedy for my benefit. Pratt falls and peekaboo, open eyes careful to make sure I'm watching. At two, she knows she's funny, and if I have a sin of pride, it is her every joke. The stumbling new words, the toddling lead up to the punchline, the way she soaks up my laughter. She knows this attention is special. And I want to warn her that it can be a lonely place, but I don't want to kill the room. So instead, I indulge her with daddy's straight lines only a daughter could love. You fall down? Yes, daddy. I go, ah, boom. I want to weep to tell her that we do this, making other people laugh because it feeds us. Four out of five doctors immune to suicide know funny is strong medicine. A, a placebo in bad jacket plaid, a clown pill goofing on all the straight face poisons. The wisest doctors write prescriptions on banana peels with joy buzzers. So I tell Autumn, embrace satire as religion. Pray to a trick moon. Listen for God playing do -do -do and keep that sound holy. But most of all, I want to warn her that there are bitter people in this world who will resent her clown shoes, who will try to trip her up just because they can only laugh when they're cruel. Forgive them, Autumn. Some bad jokes are an acquired taste, and some people aren't cut out to be gourmet. Most of all, I want her to know the rules that are unwritten. Always be kind when you roast somebody. Only tease like that out of love. But be fierce and beautiful in your parodies. After all, what can the jester say to the king? Anything. Autumn, I whisper to her when she's asleep. Always try to be funny for the right reasons. Face the world with a grin and knock-knock judo. And always try to do right by your audience. People like us need them. But most of all, May you never have such an empty space inside you that you need to mistake the sound of the audience's applause for love. How am I doing on time? I, you're holding up an arm and there's fingers at the end of it. Five, okay. Two quick haikus and then a goodbye poem. First haiku. I don't know what to say. I'm sorry about the weasels. I feel awful. <laughs> Two. Two roads diverged in a wood, but I had map quest, so that poem screwed. <laughs> okay, this last poem, this is how I met my, my wife. Um, and all I want to say about it is it's, it's a testimony to how love can work out even for two people from very, very different antidepressant prescriptions. <laughs> So you know the sound a straight jacket makes when the safety straps slip? I know, and that was only our first kiss. And we knew it would be crazy, knew the risk. To get involved like this, we'd have to learn to disagree, to agree with the voices in our heads that sentence us to solitary and do something really crazy like not listen to them. Set ourselves loose enough to measure the space it would take to live happy with one last leap of faith. Now, fortunately, uh, you've got good strong legs for jumping. I'm pretty sure my brain is a helicopter. We can do this. Too many people in this world zone themselves off for their own protection. They build lives according to blueprints for misery. They become monuments to alone when they don't have to be. There is always some place beyond our tenuously held borders where the rooftops just reach out with the same promise the sky makes to fledglings. You can go anywhere in this world you want. You just have to believe in something you can't see or touch and jump. It only sounds difficult if you get weighed down in whether it's possible. 
Now we've both had some bad falls, and there's no shame there. So even after I jump and you're still back there on your rooftop, scared, saying, I love you, but I don't dare, and I, I can't get hurt again. You better go on without me. I say, baby, I'd be crazy to leave you. And I'm crazy now. So if I leave, two crazies cancel each other out. I end up saying, and if I end up saying, I'll go crazy. I've got a better idea. I've got a flashlight in my pocket and a joke I stole from a Batman comic. I've studied physics by watching Bugs Bunny cartoons. This can work. I'm going to turn the flashlight on and put it at the roof's edge. Don't you get it? You can just walk across the light beam and you say, no, no, no. I may be crazy, but I'm not stupid. You'll just turn it off when I'm halfway there. Yeah. And I say, no, baby, I may be crazy, but it's not bad crazy. And the healthiest diagnosis I ever got was I have you. Now, love isn't a cure in itself, but it can be our invisible friend. It's got soft walls to bounce off of. It's our best medicine. With love, you can jump buildings. Now, standing here today, maybe we are 25 cents short of a dime, but we're fully invested in this crazy leap of faith called us. Our dreams, they've fallen short long enough, so I understand when you say you need to hear the word promise. I promise you, if the jump ever scares you because the distance weighs on down on you like the meds, just borrow my whirly bird brain and fly across. That way you know I'm committed too. And give up if you need to. I won't give up on you. I won't let you fall, not when a whole new city is possible for us. And hey, if the bad crazy train is coming to town, pff, get on the bus. Trust me and jump. I'll catch you. What do you think these long sleeves are for? And you won't believe the view once you get over your fear. I swear, honey, you can see our house from here. And last for our features this morning, we have Jason Miles Goss, singer-songwriter from New York City. He grew up in Hopedale, down the street from H Camp, as he notes. When he was in seventh grade, his friend got a three-quarter size electric guitar for Christmas, and he showed Jason how to play Wipeout, <laughs> the surf rock classic, and that was it for Jason. Shortly after, his parents bought him a cheap guitar, and he started to play. And then Jason went on to play in middle school, joined a band, a school jazz band, performed in local shows. And after that, he continued on performing and writing and went to Oberlin College in Ohio and had the opportunity to meet and play with some of the most amazingly talented people, according to Jason. And he noted that he saw Josh Ritter perform there, who had graduated the year that he arrived at college, who has been a huge influence to him as well. Jason kept writing more and more. After he graduated, he rented a cheap apartment outside of Boston and tempt in the areas of law firm work, hospitals, geriatric centers, auto body, consulting agencies, interior design, nonprofits, and more, trying to pay the bills. And then he began recording in a local studio and started playing local open mics and his own shows. And in the last two years, he moved to New York City and has been writing a great deal and recording and now just finished his third CD. Jason said that he tries to dig down much deeper into the process of writing his songs without worrying where things end up. And it pays off as in 2003, he was picked as one of five finalists in the Newport Folk Festival National Songwriter Search, a four-time featured artist at the Boston Nemo Festival, 2005 finalist in the Music Maker Songwriter Competition, and he's opened for Ellis Paul, Laurie McKenna, Vance Galbert, and more. Recently, he's had a few of his songs included in the film Reticence. That was made by Alpha and Omega in California. And when asked for one of his most memorable moments sharing his songs, Jason did not refer to these honors, but instead to a memorable moment that he had with an intimate community over in Ireland. 
sharing songs. And Jason said, it was one of the greatest times I've had. There's a small town called Kinvara on the West Coast, and they had this bar called Winkle's Pub, and they had a songwriter's circle. And I had the opportunity to sit around a table with some great session players, one who played guitar for Dylan years ago. And everyone on the bar stood around, and we played during the music. You could hear a pin drop. The pub was lit by candlelight. There were dogs lying around, and everyone was just having a great time. Everyone took turns playing on everyone's songs, and I was trying to keep up. I will never forget that. The Irish people's love of stories and music was something I never experienced before. They made me feel so welcome. So we're happy and honored to have Jason with us today. And let's give a bit of an Irish pub welcome to him as well. Jason Miles Goss. Man, this is really great. Um, it's a beautiful space, and it's, it's just wonderful to hear everybody's work. Um, I'm going to play some, some new songs. I have a, uh, a, new, a new record coming out on June 13th called uh, A Plea for Dreamland. And so I'm going to be playing some songs from that. Uh, this is called Put a Record On. As, uh, as Cheryl mentioned, I grew up uh, right up the road here in, uh, in Hopedale, and uh, about three years ago, I moved to Brooklyn, New York, and uh, I had this, this apartment above this uh, coffee shop, which is great, 
but uh, terrible because I drink way too much coffee. It's just and uh, this last couple of days, I've been on a, a little bit of a run with shows, and uh, the car at this point I think is running on dreams and gas station coffee. And uh, <laughs> so this is a song about uh, uh, an ode, hopefully, to a, a, a healthier lifestyle in the future. Start starting with today. So, this is called Coffee and Wine.
watch you roll away like a wave trying to save me from sinking oh well brooklyn has eyes and they shine like a light in The ghost of another lover you left howling at the moon. Hey, she holds me like a lover. Hey, and she steals me when she goes, and she goes. A song uh, this is called peace of mind and uh, it's mainly it's mainly about just being confused I, I think uh, in today's day you know there's so much information flying around at a million miles per second and uh, sometimes you get uh, almost anesthetized by what's happening you hear reports you know 30 dead suicide bombing and it's just after a while it just kind of you it you know you absorb it and then it just goes away and it's almost like it's as equally difficult now to really know things as it was before uh, and uh, so this is a song just about feeling a little lost and uh, it's called peace of mind. Peace of mind, I'm walking down the line 
Down a street full of sirens and no vacancy signs. Am I dreaming of love or am I knee deep in lies? Am I staring at the real thing or a clever disguise? I saw it flashing on my TV screen. Well, I watched the killers chase the clowns. They were shooting pistols made with magazines. Firing their gossip all around. Now, is there anybody out there? Is there anyone at all? A thief, a judge, or a millionaire? A local hero we can call. And I'm still haunted by the sounds out on. Desolation room. See, baby blue, he's got his arms out and his chin tucked low. He's swinging hammer in the fairgrounds, shouting that he will never die. Well, he jumped the stage and pulled his mask down. And they dropped the curtain on the fly, and he was outside. He could hear the crowd; they were breaking down his door. They were screaming out for more. They were screaming out for more. Oh, peace of mind. Trying to find, I'm trying to find this peace of mind. This peace of mind. I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find this peace of mind. How am I on time? Do I have time for six? Six minutes. Okay. Um, well, again, thank you so much. I really want to thank HCAM, and this is just awesome. And uh, it's been really great playing for you all uh, this morning. So uh, I have a, a new record coming out June thirteenth, and I have an email list over there if anybody's interested. And. Uh, this is a song about the Goonies, <laughs> about a uh, a footnote in '80s culture, a, a long, long, uh, long lost hero, a brave man named Chester Copperpot. Mr. Copperpot thanks a lot, you know, a good man, surely hard to find out here, well I've been weeping in the parking lot, well I've been weeping for the ones who disappear, did you really disappear, well it started out as a memory, I watched them drag you down by the bottom of your feet. You said, I think these pirates got the best of me. I can see their daggers in the eyes of everyone I meet. I've suffered terrible defeats. And I hang my head and ooh, sweet silver dollar, but I know that help is on the way. Try to be brave. Oh, Chester Copperpot drank a lot. He would sleep by the rail yard and hide inside his coat, though. He never quit when the times got hard. He wore a pair of black laces and a pair of brown leather shoes, so he had nothing to lose. 
Well, some of us stand with our face to the fire, but all of us breathe the smoke. Love will always get you. Not broken love. Did you take me for a fool? I'm a shipwreck swimming back to you. Sweet silver dollar, but I know that help is on the way. They take me down below the water, but I, I try to be. This poem is um, I'm dedicating to my mother. Um, she's uh, she's just uh, entered a nursing home a couple of uh, months ago, and I'm actually hoping that um, that I'll be able to uh, show her this sometime on the computer um, down at the nursing home. So I'm very grateful to be here today. It's called My Beautiful Mother. You welcome each day with beauty and grace, taking one day at a time and never lose face. I admire you so and hope to achieve the faith, love, and kindness through each day that you weave. May today be as special as you are, dear mother. I love you and honor you, a space held for no other. Thank you.
This is Scattered Things. My children are like ghosts some days, vague presences that drift through the kitchen, then disappear to a world they inhabit without me. They leave evidence of their existence, discarded books, shirts scented with their aromas, a tangy mixture of deodorant mixed with sweat on the boys' gray shirts, sweet florals lingering on the sweaters of my daughter. But even these objects point more to their absence than their presence here, haunting the house like the photos of the dead. I wander through the mess, replacing books on shelves, trying to determine which gray items to wash, which to put away, setting things back in place. I tell myself it is for them, so they will have order to come home to. But I think it is for me rearranging the scenery so I am not so pained by the way their belongings tell me they are leaving me. I pick up college catalogs that look like travel posters, scribbled notes fallen from backpacks, names of people I don't know, cryptic jottings that hint at jokes and plans I may or may not ever know about. I erase their mess while they are gone so they will come back to me and fill the emptiness again with all these mysterious tokens of their growing up. The house is ready now, like a stage set, and waiting for the lights to come up. If only I can remember my lines. I'm, I'm always wondering why it is that people love to be near water. What is it that water does for us? There's something very special about it. Um, and this is a portrait of a river seen from a willow tree in the summer. Rhymes from a river. A stream so full, a swamp seems dry. A dawn, a golden scar. A chain of mallards drifting by. A distant loon's guitar. A willow sweeping bank and kill above a quick, quick mink's wake, a tethered rowboat not quite still, a glint of water snake, a tree crown shading early light, a red root sucking mud, a sap vein coursing its full height above the river flood, a human touch, the dock protrudes, an angle thrusting out, a wooden stage for solitude, a span to nurture doubt. Thank you. I'm leaving my 
king in my country. I'm inching up slate and steel. I'm bellying up to the bar in the clouds so that I can get ready to feel once more. I can get ready to feel. And the wind, it grasps at my body And doors fly open and shut I'm scaling a mountain of brick and of steel To make my way out of this rut Boys, to make my way out of this rut And it's hard now to hear what you're saying
Thank you.